Vivekananda just doesn't represent an icon. I think it's very difficult to even describe what he means. And I'm sure for most of us today, for all the young people in this audience, and everybody else in this audience, uh, describing Swami Vivekananda would be a simple, at the same time, an extremely complex exercise. So I thought for the day, keeping in mind the extraordinary significance of, I would say, uh, Bringing, up, bringing aloud and uh, visibly his message to the world at Chicago. Now it's fascinating that even the Art Institute today on its website has Swamiji, his message and, and the celebratory proclamation of the day and what it means to them in the United States. Even. So I think it's not just uh, uh, be in India who understand and celebrate his message, but I think the world over increasingly are going to be recognizing the depth and the enormity of what Swami Vivekananda brought to this world. So I would like to share uh, what I see of Swamiji and what would he mean to me today. You know, like September 11th comes every day and in a fascinatingly, uh, I would say uh, in a fascinating way actually, every single year when I sit back on this day, and start thinking about how would I interpret this message. Strangely, every year I find something more deeper and something more different. So it might possibly be very difficult for us to say, this is what Swami Vivekananda might have meant. You know, we can easily just look at the words, the three, four minutes of his speech. We can all spend hours talking about this one sentence, sisters and brothers of America. Or we can all talk about the enormity of the significance of the message of universal acceptance and tolerance, or you can talk about his love of Hinduism. There's so many ways you can see his message. So what I, I feel in my particular case is every year, as I try to understand Swamiji and this message a little better, a little deeper, I realize that somewhere deep down, I think Swamiji and this message has not altered. Swamiji might have meant exactly what he meant in 1893, in whatever was on his mind. But I think our ability to understand Swamiji, our evolution, maybe our antennas are getting more refined. We are able to see him in dimensions which are extraordinary. And as we evolve, possibly our, even our very ability to process and reflect on Swamiji's message, I think expands. And therefore, his message looks every time a little different, at least for me. But how, how would I see his message today? beyond just the semantics, beyond just the extraordinary grasp of English that Swamiji had, in a very deep sense. For me, it was, you know, on one side, the cerebral message of Swami Vivekananda himself, the enormous intellectual jayantism that Swamiji you know, represented. But in the same stroke, if you look deeper, the enormity of emotions that Swamiji carried in his way he expressed his love for this great country and saying he represented a country of so extraordinary significance. He represented a religion of such enormous depth and significance. So in one perspective, you can see his intellect shining forth. On the other side, you can see the soft, gentle, motherly emotions that comes out. On the third perspective, you see the hard, strong, philosophical nature of Swamiji and that is explanations. And there is also in one sense, you know, the desire, the enormous urgency in which he communicates his message to the world and says, you know, before it is even too late, we all need to understand the significance of the oneness of mankind itself. And I think what is, what was so relevant in 1893, we, because of our inability to learn and understand and appreciate this message. And if you do understand this message, our inability to live this very message, we make his message all the more significant and relevant even today. Today, if you look at the world and the persecution that society is undergoing at all levels, if you look at the inequities that the world today manifests itself with, if you look at the conflict situation that we create and mostly man-made, I think Swamiji and this message today rings so strong and so necessary and it is as urgent and as important as it is today as it was in the times of Swami Vivekananda. But more importantly for me, 
Swamiji in that message, and then subsequently, if you look at his entire next nine years of his life, I think the Chicago address is sort of the gentle window through which many of us can start peeping into the enormous complex divine force called Swami Vivekananda. Reducing him to a personality or a person, I think, would make would be unjust. You cannot like you cannot describe. You know, it's so difficult. Somebody asked me to describe God. The description can only be limited by my experience of that understanding. And to people like me, and just trying to appreciate Swamiji, I think it is like that peeping into a window and describing infinity that you see inside. And for us, the Chicago address is exactly that. What Swamiji gives us is a little peep into the window. And we need to go deep into the depth of his message. And as we travel, the journey will never end. And that is the beauty of his message. And that is why we can never come to a point where we say, ha, ah, now I understand Swami Vivekananda. At least I feel one lifetime or even several lifetimes might not be enough to even unpack the nine active engaged years of Swami Vivekananda's life that we know post 1893. And so understanding him will be, I would say, we should not even spend time in that, but beginning to understand him is what we should spend time. So for me, what I saw in that message of Swamiji, in that, in that little few words and then subsequently in his life, and that's what I like to share. Like I said, entering that house called Vivekananda and trying to unpack him little by little. The depth of his convictions. Convictions not just in the religious underpinning of the Vedanta and the Vedantic message. Conviction not just in the spiritual oneness of man that he was so urgently trying to proclaim. Convictions in the fact that inequities of society at that point of time and as relevant as it is today should be addressed. Conviction in the fact that young people have to take on as a mandate, as a responsibility of ourselves. How do we constantly think and worry and lose our sleep over the masses and do something for them? Conviction is the extraordinary beauty of combining emotion, cognition, and action. When he says heart to feel, head to think, and hands to work, how powerful that message was. Conviction is the concept of servant leadership. Even before the rest of the world even decide to coin that word, Swami had used that word. The powerful message of not just tolerance, tolerance in Swamiji's ways of just one beginning of a journey, but leading on to the idea of universal acceptance, not just of religion. Today we just bring it down to religion. But I think if you go deep down, acceptance of every way of life, acceptance of every different perspective, whether it is dress or clothing or food, or boundaries or countries. Convictions in the nationalistic boundaries of India and Swamiji uh, and the boundaryless existence of humankind itself. What a beautiful concept. For others, it could have been so paradoxical. How could somebody believe so strongly in being Indian and still love the whole world? And Swamiji has represented that. That extraordinary gentleness that he could show along with the sternness that he could manifest. Now, there is so much, so much of message that we can see in him. Reducing him to a mere youth icon, again, like I would say, it's just a starting point. But expand, beginning from there and expanding him into understanding why he might have asked us to take care of the concept of Tyaga and Seva. You know, how he was so beautiful in connecting the idea of private gain with public good even so many years ago, where he understood that India as a nation could not progress without the energy of young people. And it is relevant today because 17, into the 75th year of our independence, well, the whole country is celebrating the Amrit Mahotsav. The celebration of Amrit Mahotsav would not be complete without celebrating the message of Vivekananda every single day, not just this year, but every year of this country. Swamiji was so clear in his thinking that in this idea of living this message and making this country what he dreamt it to be, that is the way we would become a Jagat Guru. Our Jagat Guru is not simply a message that we take to the world, but the immersive experience of the life of oneness that he asks us to live with everything around. That is the beauty of Swamiji's message to the whole world. And I think, young people today, it is time to pause and reflect. How can we align this message of Swamiji 
to the very need of this country. And I think that is where, that is a speciality of Swamiji, where he spoke about several things and I'd like to share a few. The understanding of how we can, we need to evolve from the control of our internal nature. Today, what the world needs to understand is not power over somebody. It is not one nation's power over somebody or one person's power over somebody. If you truly understand Swamiji's message, it is about the power over ourself or the power within ourselves that Swamiji spoke about, the internal nature that he spoke about. What our young generation needs today is to appreciate the con concept of understanding internal nature as much as they go and thrive in the world of the external nature. Today, the COVID scenario has demonstrated the appreciation of this. Now, I was interacting, I keep interacting with a lot of young people, both my students and otherwise. They realize COVID is not just a milestone in health. It is not just a significant public health challenge, but what COVID taught us was the fallibility of man, was the vulnerability of man, was, a man, was man who constantly believed in his own competence, the arrogant understanding of what he could achieve was reduced to ex exposing him to what he cannot achieve. And that is what I think we need to really go deep down. And, and if you look at the whole, the way the world played out, the biggest challenge our young people faced was the challenge of how to deal with themselves. And that is why today, if you look at it, the amount of mental health problems the youth of today have experienced in the last 18 months is extremely significant and frightening. And if only we had understood Vivekananda's message of how do we understand and appreciate the control of internal nature, I'm sure this kind of a mental health epidemic would not have been what it was, what it is today. So, so I'm, I'm going, moving ahead in this message and its relevance, finding a purpose, his convictions in transacting our existence as an expression, our in, desire for our inner spiritual evolution to manifest as a desire for external Seva. What a powerful idea. You know, he gave a new dimension of the understanding of spirituality itself. Atmano Mokshartam Jagat Hitayacha. In one, one sweeping way, he made us understand that our evolution without the appreciation of the elevation of the masters of the mankind is in, irrelevant. He, he want, on the other hand, he said our evolution should be the result of our expression of service to the outside world. And such a powerful need of the day is also the need of the hour today. If you really want to bring meaning to 75 years of our existence as an independent nation, India is timeless and ageless, but it's a political entity as India. If you want to really bring meaning to it, I think the real meaning starts when we can really celebrate our spiritual freedom, our inner liberation as an external manifestation of ensuring that no Indian goes hungry, like Swamiji's words, he said, not even a dog should go hungry. What a powerful way of understanding the very expression of Seva itself. And in this process, he spoke about the enormous Tyaga. And Tyaga, even when I understood it, I thought initially in my days of the work I was doing with the indigenous tribal communities in the forest of Mysore, I thought giving up urban life, giving up all the physical benefits of being a doctor in a city, that was great Tyaga. And I think that is a very narrow interpretation of Tyaga itself. With evolution, I realized that is not the Tyaga Vivekananda must have meant. Possibly, as I started getting to understand him deeper and deeper, it is the Tyaga of the very concept of I am doing something. It is the Tyaga of the enormous drive to express yourself and be visible. This, 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 the Tyaga of the fact of saying that I am somebody important. You know, th that very understanding of the I and the mind and transcending that very idea, I'm going ahead and saying, we are instruments of that powerful divine force. It's very easy to intellectualize this, but trying to live it and trying to become insignificant, but at the same time being significant, trying to be absent, while at the same time being present, I think that is sadhana by itself. And Vivekananda showed us that if you really want to be, to be useful, do some karma for India, but if you really want to be something extraordinary, convert the karma into karma yoga and become insignificant in this process. It is not easy, my young friends. I think today is a day for us to understand this powerful message of Swamiji because embedded in this message is not just the outer expression, but the inner evolution. 
and the tyaga is as much important for the inner evolution as seva is for the outer manifestation. And this is one, one extraordinary way of understanding it. And most of the time, when we think of September 11th, we reduce Swamiji into an intellectual jaint. But deep down, if you scratch the surface and go beyond the depth of his speech that he gave that day, you will possibly understand the expansive humanism that he represented. What an extraordinary combination. Today, either some people are driven by the gigantic intellectualism and they stop there. Or some people are so driven by the concept of that maternal, gentle, compassionate existence of caring for human beings or humanity as such. But finding this extraordinary combination of both in one single person or personality itself is a fascinating idea. And I think we need to see what element of that can we replicate and understand and immerse ourselves in? So to me, what the country needs today is not just the message of Swamiji and his extraordinary thinking, but going deeper, living the life and message of Swami Vivekananda himself. So if we are to really celebrate it, the message of 1893, I think we have to understand that there is a Vivekananda waiting to express itself within each one of us. Finding that expression is a real way of understanding Swamiji's message today. What India wants today is not a mere imitation of his words, but the powerful expression of his existence within each one of us. Now, this is what is a revolution that organization like the Ramakrishna Mission is doing, especially centers like the Center for Human Excellence. It is not just a training program or a webinar or a session or a speech. I think these are opportunities for us to wake up that inner Swami Vivekananda in us and get him to express himself in ways in which only magic can happen for India and not just for India, for the whole world at large. Because in this expression, we will not stop at one level. And how does that seva itself manifest is what something we have to spend some little time on. Swamiji's way of expressing seva was so, so you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a simplistic way, was incremental. The easiest expression Swami asked us to do is the physical seva, daika seva, sharirika seva. You know, when we say seva, it looks very, you know, we always think that giving up something and going and sitting in a forest or, uh, you know, going and living their life in a slum is seva. That maybe is one way of looking at it. But Swamiji's way of expressing it was so beautifully. Uh, evolutionary. He said the least you can do is worry about the other human being, the physical nature of the body, because all of us cannot experience the oneness just because we talk about it. It's very easy to see the other. It's very easy to become the difficult to become the other. So when you see the other and the challenges and the difficulties, can we relate to the other, relate to their suffering and do something for the human body? The hospitals we build, the old age homes that we construct, or the orphanages that we run could be expressions. Why? Simple things like picking up the paper on the street, that, that, that little trash that we throw, telling ourselves we will not throw it on the streets. That is also national service. We, are, we have to understand national service of multiple dimensions. National service is not something where you come to Delhi and become a minister or something like that. Even every small act that we are doing, if we can bring this element that some human being somewhere is going to benefit by it. You know, in a very in a very small, even taking a thorn or a nail from the road and putting it aside. Some small thing like that. Even. It's also national service. That physical act. But then, that's easy for all of us to do. So we don't have to read Vivekananda and understand this complex message. We can just start living Vivekananda by the simple act. In one of my books, I write and this, this incident happened outside the Ramakrishna Ashram in Mysore. I used to go every evening there, walking there. There's a, there's a traffic light close to the Ramakrishna Mission. And I was standing there waiting to cross the road. And I never even, you know, we are all so busy with our lives. It's very strange. And sometimes when our inner noise is so loud, we don't seem to hear the outer noise at all. So maybe I was going through that phase at that on that day, and I never heard a little baby crying. A two, three-year-old child was crying. And suddenly, when the possibly the crying became loud, or when my inner noise became less, I heard the baby crying. I looked at the baby. 
and I saw that she was possibly alone, she, uh, mother or nobody, no adult was near her. And around two, three feet away from the crying child was a woman who was selling bananas on the street. And that is when I noticed she was in a heated argument with the fellow who was trying to buy the bananas. You know, in India, we have this strange uh, paradox. You walk into a mega store owned by a billionaire, you'll simply pay the price that the label says and you buy it and come. But you go to the roadside poor little street vendor, you would like to haggle and take every little uh, profit that the vendor makes back to you. You know, if you go to that big reliance store, we don't mind paying water paper stuck on that label and we pay 20 rupees, 30 rupees, 40 rupees for three bananas and come back. But here this fellow was trying to say, give me four bananas. And she was trying to say 10 rupees, three bananas. So the argument went for some time. It was very fascinating. So much that I stopped even crossing the road as watching what will happen. You know, human nature is fascinating. And finally, this lady, this elderly lady, in disgust shouted at the customer and said, I will not sell my bananas to you. You are not worthy enough of being sold the bananas. Go away. And the fellow walked away. Then this lady also noticed the child crying. One minute ago, she was refusing to give that extra banana, four bananas for 10 rupees. But the very next minute when she saw the child crying, unhesitatingly, she plucked two bananas from her. And the I had also seen the child crying. And in my mind, the first thought that came was, this child is alone. Who is the responsible adult was left this child alone? That is all I thought about. And some vehicle will come and have an accident now. But for her, that is the beauty of the, that extraordinary, expansive humanism that I spoke about in that woman at that moment of time. That mother in her plucked the two bananas, gave it to the child. One minute ago was a transactional loss if she gave one banana. The next minute was an expression of divinity in giving those two bananas to the baby. And she is sitting out at the Ramakrishna mission. And in all my curiosity, I asked her, have you, have you gone inside the ashram? Have you heard of somebody called Ramakrishna or Mamsa or Swami Vivekananda? And she had no idea. But without even hearing about them, she was actually leaving the message of Atmano Mokshartam Jagati Thayacha. She was leaving the message of Shiva Jnana Jiva Seva. And that one instant, she was awakening the Vivekananda inside her. She did not have to even get into the Ramakrishna mission for that. Without even that, she was leaving that message. But this looks like a small incident to all of us. But there are hundreds of opportunities for every person, young or old, to manifest this Vivekananda in very, very, very expressive forms of just the caring for the other, recognizing the divinity in the other, and trying to do something about it in a physical sense. And as we become better and better at it, we will elevate ourselves. We will grow and we'll become a little stronger, a little better, a little purer. We become like that, you know, the constant purification that keeps happening. And then we become eligible for what Swamiji says, the Bodhik Seva, intellectual service that we can do. From the Sharirik Seva, we evolve into doing something more, more little more elevated, which is driven by the, the growing purity in us, the growing energy in us, the growing power within us. The more we unpack the power within us, the more expressive it becomes. And then we, the tools we run, the awareness programs that we conduct, all that that the Center for Human Excellence is doing. All these are expressions of that same. But then Swamiji talks about the next level of service. And in my earlier days, I had interpreted Swamiji's message as, you know, somewhere I have to go do the Adhyatmic Seva. Now I realize maybe that is not what Swamiji must have meant, or maybe I am understanding Swamiji differently today. I realize the Sharirik Seva and Bhautik Seva is reasonably easier to do. That is what I've been doing for the last 30, 35 years. But then the moment I say, I am doing it, I'm losing my capability to do the third service at the Atmik Seva. What Swami Vivekananda meant was when the Seva and the Tyaga, the Tyaga of the I, gets combined with the Seva that you were doing, then the real Adhyatmic Seva happens to yourself. The, that ability to transact Seva as a physical or a cognitive change in the outside world, you develop the, you know, and if you convert it and transcend the sense of I am doing it and start seeing yourself as an instrument, an extraordinarily refined instrument that the Lord is using, then I think we start doing Adhyatmic Seva for ourselves. So it is not about Seva for others. I think that Seva happens to oneself is what I have started to understand Swamiji today as. So in, in Swamiji's own way, 
I think we now need to go back and refresh our understanding of this extraordinary force. Like I said, limiting him to just an ex expression of a statue or a photograph, it's just a representation. But this enormous idea, this force within us, where this force expresses itself as something for good of mankind and something which makes this world more peaceful, more harmonious, more prosperous. That is what he might have meant as universal acceptance, where we accept everything as it is, where we are even able to accept ourselves as we are. Now, I find it very strange. We all struggle to accept the outside world, but what we actually have to struggle first is to accept ourselves as we are. Today, young people spend a lot of time on labeling themselves. I'm an introvert, I'm an extrovert, I have mental problems, I'm, I'm uh, not this, I am that, I am this. Half the time, we are worried about what we are not. I'm not beautiful, I am fat, I am thin, I am short, and all these labels we give ourselves. I think the real journey that Swamiji must have meant, the easiest beginning of the journey of universal acceptance is first my own personal acceptance of myself. Before we start showing compassion to the rest of the world, if we can start showing compassion to ourselves, that is a preparation for showing compassion to others. So accepting ourselves with all our inadequacies, with all our flaws, with all our defects and not even seeing them as defects is a beginning point of transcending those defects. And maybe that is what Swamiji must have meant. Can we start our journeys that way? That is the beginning point of sadhana in Vivekananda's terms. He just uses seva as an instrument for refining ourselves on the inside. And I think I've spoken enough about it, but my way of looking at it is, this is what the country needs today. The country today is suffering from a moral vacuum. The country today is suffering from having a, the leadership that can be embedded with these concepts. The country today is absolutely in seek of people whose capacities, not just the intellectual capacities, but the humanistic capacities have to be part of their lives. And this is when Swamiji becomes so relevant. If you truly want to understand Vedanta in Swamiji's language, he's a practical Vedanta. I think maybe this is the way to begin that. And we have to use the 75 years of India's independence as possibly a symbolic, I wouldn't say beginning. India was, I think, in our own ways have begun, but a symbolic strengthening of this idea and go ahead in life, looking at every single opportunity that we can give ourselves. And that is what gives us meaning. I know it might sound very ideological to tell young people to give up everything in service of the nation. And I'm not going to make that foolish, impractical mistake. All I'm asking you is take care of yourselves. Swamiji always said, save on a full stomach. Take care of yourselves, build your capacities, build your abilities. But remember, you're building all this for the others. And like Swamiji's own language in the letter to the Mysore Maharaja, when he says, the vanities of life are transient. Now, we cannot explain the transience of the vanities of life to other people today. There are too many distractions. There are too many attractions for people to say vanities are going to be transient. It's difficult to understand. But the second part is easier. He says, he alone lives who lives for others. So if you want to become that person full of life for ourselves and for this country, the real expression of that life is living for others. The rest are more dead than alive. What India in the 75th year means is this enormous life killing force, this enormous life giving, life generating ideas of Swami Vivekananda, where we like, take care of ourselves, understand that private gains are okay, but that is not the end. That's only a beginning. Private gains for public good. Constantly thinking about how do I build myself in every possible way for doing what Swami Vivekananda wanted. And that is what life is all about. And that is a life, my young friends, we all have to live. Time is short, like Swami said, and it is time for us to give up our lives for a great cause. And what greater cause than you can find? But combining your inner evolution with the outer expression of national good. That is the message that we have to give every young Indian today. And together, let's build a nation that we can all be proud of. Let's give ourselves the future that we deserve. And in, in the world imitating what we create, we become the living embodiment of Swamiji's message of Jagat Guru that India needs to become. And we will take this message of oneness to every nook and corner of the world. 
by just showing how to live it. We don't have to even say that Vivekananda told us this. By just giving this message, the world will understand how powerful Swamiji's message is. So on this day, let's rededicate ourselves to everything Swami Vivekananda stood for. And let us promise ourselves that every day, every day of our lives, there'll be a small piece of our life that we'll unpack. I remember before I conclude that extraordinary book that was written about Swami Vivekananda by Elena Stark. Now she said, a gift unopened. That's what is the title of the book. Where she says the United States had received this powerful gift in 1893 called Swami Vivekananda. And in her research, historical research, as a historian, she found that America became a nation in real expression post-1893. And in that book she writes, if Christopher Columbus can be credited with the discovery of America, we must credit Swami Vivekananda for the discovery of the soul of the land of America. What a powerful way of saying this. Now, America is discovering Vivekananda. It is time for us to discover and unpack Vivekananda for India and Indians to begin with, and then the rest of the world will follow. So, thank you so much for this opportunity for sharing some of my thoughts. Swamiji and this message is something so fascinating for me that if allowed to talk, I never know when to stop. <laughs>